and it is referred to as the title we've given it is Provisions of Christ's Blood. That's what we sang about this. Provisions of Christ's Blood. What? As the shed blood of Christ provided to us. I want to start off with a, um, a story, which I have probably shared at some point with you. And uh, it concerns the year I spent in Burundi that was back in the dark ages, 71, 72. And uh, one of the major evangelistic outreaches uh, in the capital of uh, Bujumbura uh, and near environs was film evangelism. And it was fascinating to go to these. We'd set up a huge, we'd set up posts ahead of time and stretch this big canvas a screen across it, and then we had a projection booth that was up on stilts. It took us a day or a day and a half to set up. And uh, the approach to using the films was interesting because they didn't use the soundtrack because they weren't, we had no films in Swahili or Kirundi. Uh, and so uh, Carl Johnson had a number of evangelistic films and we used to be able to borrow some from the U.S. Embassy, sort of public information things, just general interest uh, films, and they would project those. And Carl Johnson would preach to go along with the film. He would preach in Swahili, and then one of the local brethren would translate into Kirundi. Uh, and it was fascinating to watch uh, people seeing films for the first time. I remember one visit up country. Um, we were in an area where people had never seen films before. And when somebody would walk off the edge of the screen, they would look on the ground to see where the person was. It was just completely new. But there was one particular film we showed um, that was called The Power in the Blood. And it and went, went through, through scripture, scripture and took highlight, highlight stories, stories and talked talk about, about the shedding, shedding of blood for the remission of sin. sin. I remember scenes, scenes from, from the life, life of, of, uh, of Abraham, Abraham. his you know, intent to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And, uh, and then it went right through the cross. And when we showed that film, we knew there were going to be problems. Uh, there was one case where just before we were ready to start projecting, um, a local official pulled up and told us we didn't have proper permits. Well, we had permits from his boss, but he said that didn't count, and he was going to cancel us. Um, Carl was able to resolve that on the spot. Another time, we had a technical problem. Uh, turned out to be a connection between the generator and the, uh, uh, the projector. And it took a while to figure that out. That's where I was on. I couldn't do any preaching. So I was more on the mechanical side, but we got that fixed. Another time, we don't know who these people were, what their motivation was, but they started throwing stones at us, particularly the people up on the up front who were doing the lecture. And Carl Johnson shared with me that he had become convinced through the years that the reason we had trouble when we planned to show that film because the gospel message was so very powerful and that Satan didn't want it preached. He didn't want the film show. And so we just knew that uh, if that was on the schedule for the rotation for a particular campaign, we needed to pray specifically about that. power and the importance of Christ shed blood simply cannot be overstated. And our little series is going to look at some of the specific things we find in the New Testament that are listed as the results or the provisions of Christ shed blood. Here they are in order. You don't have to write these down. You'll hear them over the next couple of weeks, but one, we have redemption. Two, we are saved from wrath. Third, we are reconciled 
to God. Fourth, our sins are forgiven. Fifth, we are justified. Sixth, we are brought near. And seventh, we have eternal life. Now, it's going to be readily apparent that a lot of these uh, blessings and achievements that come through the ship are interwoven. You can hardly separate them, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, tonight. But these are the topics we're going to take up over coming weeks, and we're probably not going to have, um, we probably won't get all of them done this fall because we have so many missionaries coming through the area, and we want to take advantage of their availability. So some of these uh, topics will probably be pushed off a couple of months. Um, but I would encourage all of us as we go through this series to think of two things. One is, regarding the specific topic of the evening, to just develop a deep appreciation for this blessing that we have and the fact that it cost Christ his blood. And the second is to think about the cumulative weight of all seven of these blessings, all of them brought about for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I just think when we look at that whole picture, it is no wonder that Satan wants to thwart or preaching about the blood of Christ. So now let's think about our topic for this evening. And these are devotionals. They're, they're all, we, they could easily become theological discussions uh, or studies, but that's not our purpose for this series. Take away the big issue, big points, uh, the big takeaways. So our key verse this evening, the topic is that we have redemption. And our key verse is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, I think we need to start off with a definition and just say, what does this word redemption mean? It means to be set free by the payment of a price, to be set free by the payment of a price. And this concept is found very clearly in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but for different, with respect to different audiences, so to speak. So for example, in the Old Testament, the continual thought all the way through the Old Testament um, is that Israel belongs to God as a purchased people. He purchased them. Now, very often that thought goes back to their captivity in uh, Egypt and the fact that God brought them out by a mighty hand. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 15. You shall remember that you were, past tense, a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. So they were being told, remember what you were, and remember the redemption that took place by God. You now belong to him, and I'm making a command to you this day, and you better follow it because you belong to God. So that's the thought in the Old Testament. Now, there are actually three different words that go into that idea of redemption. We won't take time to go through those tonight among other reasons, because I don't even know how to pronounce them. But that's the Old Testament. Now, when we get into the New Testament, um, the audience is not Israel, but God's redeemed people, all those who trust Christ by faith. And the background of the word, again, there are multiple words, I think five different Greek words that are used to flesh out this idea of redemption, but we're gonna look at the big picture, which is this that the background of the word, word relates to the slave market, where the buyer goes in and pays whatever price is demanded for the release of a slave. I go into that market, I pay the price, and then actually, this is important, I take him out of that slave market. In other words, the change of status. It's not just a, simply a financial uh, transaction. The ownership of the slave changes. Um, but really, when you look at all of these 
New Testament words related to um, redemption. The big picture is that it's just a comprehensive term. It's used in a very general way uh, to describe the provision of salvation through the blood of Christ. Uh, Paul is the primary New Testament author that uses this word redemption. It's not exclusive to him, but he's the most frequent user of the word. And he uses it to describe the, the believer's release from bondage and enslavement to sin. And a transition, a change that takes place because our loyalties are then transferred from sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one, Christ, who paid the price, and he then becomes named our Redeemer. I'm tempted to sing that, that one of those, uh, uh, my Redeemer. Oh, what beauties in that name, lovely name appear. That's the thought there. Christ is named our Redeemer because he is the one that paid the price. Now, it's interesting that in this key verse, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins linked together in one verse. And one of our later topics, later in the series, is going to focus on the forgiveness of sins. That subject stands mightily on its own. But it's interesting that we have the two here linked together. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that you can't have one without the other. You can't have redemption without the forgiveness of sin. And you can't have the forgiveness of sin without redemption. They are intimately linked. And in all of this understanding of what the word redemption means, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, what we're to understand is that Christ's blood was the price paid for redemption. Somebody had to pay the bill, and Christ paid it with his own blood. So that basically is what the word means, what the concept is we're talking about here. And I think it's then fair to ask the next question, which is, why was blood necessary? Why was blood necessary? Well, we have the key verse for us here uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, uh, where we're told that blood is essential for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, the verse in Hebrews reads, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And we could spend hours going through the Old Testament and looking at all of the details surrounding the shedding of blood uh, at the tabernacle and then later in the temple and how the shedding of blood was linked to um, cleansing from sin and conditional forgiveness for sin because ultimately that sin could be forgiven only based on Christ's work, but God could forgive sin in the Old Testament dispensation because he knew in his foreknowledge and omniscience that Christ would make that sacrifice and it would be sufficient to save everyone who placed faith in God. So the blood of Christ was necessary because blood just in general was necessary to provide remission for sin. So we're needing in need of an intervention, isn't that a, they have programs on, on television now, you know, where they try to turn it into to, to entertainment. Somebody needs an intervention. We need to jump into this person's life and help them through this challenge, right? An intervention. Well, we certainly were in need of an intervention because there was not going to be any forgiveness of sin, and we would have been condemned to eternal death and separation from God if we remained in our sin. God staged the intervention, to put it in those contemporary terms. And the intervention was that Christ would step forward and shed his blood, and we would receive then forgiveness as a result. I want to take us back to Isaiah 53 and have you look at pronouns. Not in the contemporary sense where pronouns are a, a joke and a morass. Um, uh, let's look at the pronouns referring to the Lord Jesus and to us prophetically in Isaiah. Um, surely, verse 4, surely he 
has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He has borne our griefs and sorrows. He and us. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. It was a great substitution. It was a great intervention. He stepped into a place that we couldn't occupy ourselves and wrought a work which we could not work on our own. We're deep now into this substitutionary debt of the Lord Jesus. Now, the New Testament has the same principle set forward for us, not in perhaps such flowery language. I don't know. I guess Isaiah was at least somewhat a poet. Peter was not. But the verse, key verse in Peter, chapter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. So here again, we have this wonderful pairing. He's bearing the burden. He bore our sins in his own body, and we by faith have forgiveness of our sins, and we are set free to live for him. We're no longer slaves to sin. We transfer our allegiance our new slave owner is the Lord Jesus, and he owes uh, our complete loyalty. Um, because I can't resist, we'll throw in one theological term here, which is vicarious. Theologians refer to the death of the Lord Jesus as being vicarious, which means uh, one takes the place of another. In his death, he was taking our place. His blood was shed instead of ours. So the substitution of Christ's blood for ours, the blood of the righteous man, um, is what has provided for our full redemption of Christ. I think there's an interesting way to tie this all up to, to the conclude as a conclusion, and it's the in the, the this. And point number three, I'm going to have three little points here. Uh, the third one emphasis, emphasizes the consequences of what we've been talking about. Redemption can be seen as having three components. The first is that people are redeemed from something. We're redeemed from sin. Second, people are redeemed by something, in this case, the blood of Christ. And third, people are redeemed to something. There's a change in status. We mentioned in the New Testament that the concept is not just Christ going into the slave market, paying price and, you know, and buying us, but he then takes us out of that. And so we are redeemed to something. We've been freed from the old slavery to sin, and then we're called on to renounce our independence, our freedom to take on a new slave, the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's an obligation that comes through this whole discussion of redemption. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Just read our Ephesians verse one more time. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. What a wonderful thing that is. All right. It's time to move on to our prayer time.